Good morning again to you all. This is Juan Jose Gutierrez, SBS 300, Fall 2018. In this second part of the presentation for the day, I'm going to be talking about Pierre Bourdieu and uh, his theory of uh, habitus and symbolic capital. Uh, similarly to Giddens, Pierre Bourdieu is interested in explaining how society moves through time, uh, how is society working at one moment in time, but then how it, it transforms itself uh, through time. He is also deeply grounded on the classical traditions of, of uh, social theory. And uh, we were just reminded how, whereas in uh, the 19th century, you had two um, contending paradigms of understanding society, one really interested in how society manages to stay together and integrated in, in, uh, in a whole. And then the other one more interested in explaining how society transform, transforms through time. And um, for, for peer review, it is important to explain how society structures and restructures itself. So let's get to it. For, for peer review, probably more prominently than uh, for Anthony Giddens, the core of his concern is understanding that relationship that exists between the individual and society as a whole. He's trying to find out ways to explain in, uh, that, uh, that relationship. The most important seminal work in which he does this is a piece that was uh, published in an edited, um, very important book uh, by in the Cambridge Studies in Social and Cultural Anthropology, and in which he writes what he called the outline of a theory of practice. So it's not so much to outline an understanding on, on how we behave, but it's clearly an outline into understanding how our behavior is framed and reframes the society that we live in. And that's what he calls practice. I bet you can see the similarities uh, with Giddens. Uh, for you, more prominently than Giddens, if you're asking me what's the difference, I think Bourdieu will be much more interested in the cultural components of that practice than in uh, the um, more structural components of it, which will be more like the liking of Giddens. <clears throat> So as, um, as Bourdieu begins explore, exploring the theory of practice, he reminds us that we're social beings with diverse intentions and motives. And the question is, where are these intentions and motives coming from? How are these in intentions framed and created and then acted upon? And if we are able to address this question, then we should be able to have a better understanding of how society works. So what, what happens here is in, in the interaction between uh, intentions, motives, and the existing structures, that is the interaction between the human agency and the social structure, that society is created and recreated constantly. One or the other, structure or individual agency, are sufficient to understand all the social phenomena. So when, um, when we focus on these two aspects, we shall be able to explain and understand the social phenomena. For Bourdieu, we would like to keep in mind a number of um, of important concepts that actually I think would be worth um, uh, learning by heart and, and memorizing, right? These are critical concepts that uh, help Bordeaux frame and, and organize his explanation of, um, of the restructuration of society. So the concepts are agency, field, habitus, doxa, cultural capital, methodological individualism, 
structuralism and then structuration, which would be the key word that he uses to talk about society, the theory of structuration. How is it that society is structured? All right, let's uh, take one at a time. So agency. Agency is a human ability to act independently upon and to change the world. So exactly like Giddens, he sees human agency as um, deeply grounded on, on free will and free action. So we are not only acting based on what we've been told to do and how in the ways that we've been socialized, but we use that as a context that enables uh, our independent action on the world. So we choose to act. And in that sense, he, much like Eden's, tags on the um, theories that were uh, prevalent in, in American sociology in the second part of the 20th century with tackled Parsonian thought. But, um, but the complexity and the distance with uh, tackled Parsons is that it is not just the action that explains society, but it will be the actions in the context, in the structural context. So what is agency? It's the human ability to act independently upon and change the world. Um, as we will see in a moment, Bordeaux sees society as um, comprised of different layers. And each of those layers are fields of action in which we behave under certain rules. A university is a field of action with specific rules that is different from field of action that you will find, for example, if you were to work in a city, in a city hall, for example. There's another set of rules that are applying there, and even language. So each of those are fields that humans move from one to another. We're capable of of, uh, of living and, and and interacting in multiple fields at a time at different moments, if you like, but th those, that's the, that is a basic component of any social uh, context. So field would be a social space, structure with uh, its own rules, schemes of domination, legitimate options. Um, fields are not just social classes as uh, it was represented by, by, say, Marx and other theorists, but actually for for Bordeaux, fields can be many other um, areas of um, of structured um, behavior, which includes, as I was giving in my example, education, politics, and then you can think of the arts, the law, and, and the economy. So that is a field, a social space structured with its own rules. And it's a multitude of fields that conform the social reality, the totality of it. That's a field. <coughs> habitus. This is very person, uh, uh, um, pe peculiar to Bourdieu's theory. Okay. So when you see the word habitus, then that should sort of trigger the name of, of Pierre Bourdieu. Habitus is simply the, the sum of our activities within any specific field and our um, ability to act following certain rules in, in that context, right? So it is formally defined as a collective system of dispositions, a collective meaning that is shared, collective system, uh, mostly referring to rules of action, collective system of dispositions, I'm ready to do something. Collective act, uh, system of dispositions that individuals or groups have. In other words, it is the embodiment of the structure in the human practice. The dispositions are, is the knowledge that we have as to how to behave and interact in, in, a, in a given specific field. Some people are better at understanding these dispositions or having these dispositions, and these individuals will tend to dominate in those specific fields. And this is why we get training to work and live in those different fields. We train our children to behave in the field of a family, for example, in the context of a family. We train our students to be ready to um, have certain um, 
um, activities in the university, those, because they come with those dispositions. And some are better uh, disposed to act in that field, and that gives them in change, in turn, going back to Weber, give, give them power. Knowledge, in that sense, the knowledge of the system will give you power in that specific field. That's habitus. Now, the doxa, it's closely related to what habitus is, but it, it's actually in, in a different diction, directionality. The doxa is the sets of rules that are prevailing in a field that are then used to grade or to assess the performance of an individual in the field. Uh, the formal definition will be a constructed vision of reality so naturalized that it appears to be only a vision of reality learned, fundamental, deep founded on conscious beliefs and values taken as self-evident universals. These universals inform an agent's actions and thoughts. So the doxa is the existing knowledge in any given field that are informing uh, the individual into behaving in certain ways. Let me try to uh, rephrase this so that it, uh, it, it, it can hopefully help to make some connections. This is clearly what um, action theory has been saying all along. That is that we are socialized, remember Parsons, we're socialized into certain norms, behaviors and beliefs and those norms, behaviors, and beliefs will inform, in turn, my actions in that specific field. And uh, the thing is, we have to remember that uh, what the Parsons and Parsonian theory and action theory is failing to clarify for us is the extent to which we actually create those, uh, those forms, and then those forms are used to <coughs> qualify in, in and ascertain our level of performance in that specific field. People are examined then in their capacity to belong or not to that specific field by the prevailing doxa in the field. So it's deeply related to habitus, but let's say that it is the habitus that it's living in the specific field somewhat independently or though in a related way to the individuals that will be um, uh, becoming part will become part of that specific field and the dox is the one that is used to qualify the performance of that individual people are then examined in their capacity to belong or not to that field by the dox <coughs> an example would be at a university if you're a professor you're expected to have a long uh, trajectory within the institution so there's a system in place that will be checking what's your performance like as you move along uh, through time in performing in that specific field. And uh, so we call that sort of a, a, a reten tenure retention protocols in university, in universities. We call that the RTP system, retention, retention, tenure, and promotion, right? So that is the DOXA in the field of education in California today. <clears throat> now that DOXA is continually uh, question, challenge, and modified by the very same actors that are being examined by that uh, set of values and beliefs. And the same applies to other fields of action. Okay, let's keep going. Cultural capital, another very important and, and typical component of Bordeaux's uh, theory. Cultural capital are the resources or assets that enable holders to mobilize cultural authority in a specific field. It's how much you know about that context. Is uh, is your know-how, so to speak, is your uh, business acumen, if you're in the business uh, sphere, is your knowing what to do and, uh, at any given time. That's your cultural capital. We inherit this cultural capital uh, from others who have been in the field and uh, sometimes comes from the family, sometimes comes from friends, from, from colleagues, and we use that cultural capital, resources and assets to navigate in the field. 
So in other words, we're navigating the field based on our action. The actions are informed by this cultural capital. Giddens, Giddens, sorry for that. Bordeaux feels that in order to explain the structuration of society, it is important to keep in mind the, um, the tenets of methodological individualism, which is um, the, the theory that, uh, that stems out of, of, um, of action, action theory, the consideration of human action. So what methodological individualism is proposing, as we know, is that social phenomena is to be explained by individual agency. So don't go to the structure, don't go to the social class, go to the individual agency. And the idea is uh, that the structure is not determining the human act, human behavior, but the opposite. It's human behavior the one that structures the, the totality of society. So um, macro social events in methodological individualism should be explained in terms of, of the, um, the compound totality of individual action. So it is the, the media of individuals acting that actually generate the structure and the, the macro structures in society, which actually are devoid of reality. So once we keep this in mind, and we keep in mind what Bordeaux is saying of, of individual action is that we can understand structuration. So, so that's um, o opposite to methodological individualism. You would have a structuralist positions, which he's also critical of. In structuralism, he says that structuralism privileges the social structure of the social action. Ultimately, like Marx uh, uh, represented in his time, we act based on what our social class position dictates. We're not going to go against our interests, but our interests are ultimately the interest of uh, social class that we belong to. Therefore, individual action is not relevant. What's relevant is the structure that is constraining that behavior, right? So structuralism supports the idea that there are larger overarching systems or structure that explains human action. For example, language. We don't create the language that we speak. We are born into a language the, the linguistics would, would uh, propose. We are, think of this, we are born into a language because the language actually structures the reality that we live surrounded by. It is the words that we learn that enable us to say things and see things in a certain way. That's why in different cultures you have different nuanced understandings of things that are transmitted through generations by, by the structure of language. That would be an example, language of a larger structure or a larger overarching system that is explaining human action. So we can negate the tenets of methodological individualism that is reminding us that the social phenomenon has no existence outside the specific actions of individuals. And I can see that, and I can actually agree with that. By the same token, I can see how there are larger structures that frame and constrain those activities that I'm engaged in. So, so you see this tension of two understandings that are, that are similarly based on evidence and similarly powerful as paradigms of explaining things, but none of which, either one of these two, are sufficient to explain what's going on in society. That's why Bordeaux, much like Giddens, are looking for slightly different ways of bringing together these two elements, and in the case of Bordeaux, it would be with his theory of structuration. What he sees is that social life is more than just the, the random individual life. And, uh, but he also sees that those actions, those individual acts, are not merely determined by social forces. So there's more to it. So he's stating that human agency and social structure are actually intertwined and are two elements in the same pond, as I was explaining with Giddens. Now the word praxis that is also taken from, from uh, Marxism and New Marxism comes to 
to Bordeaux and it gets a new a new meaning. Praxis will be that repetition of acts of individual agents that enable for the reproduction or the subversion of the social structure. And here's the key nuanced difference. So individual agents will do create and recreate society, but um, but framed by, by the pre-existing society, and not just to reproduce it, but probably to subvert that social structure. So by doing this, he creates the conditions to understand social transformation and historical transformations, which was the main concern of, uh, of Marx, as we all remember. So here's two fundamental definitions that, that, or concepts that have been, been redefined by by Bordeaux in, in very important ways, social structure and individual action. Social structure, therefore, will be traditions, institutions, moral codes, and established ways of doing things. That is the social structure. You see, it's more of a cultural understanding than the Gideon. Uh, Giddens is looking at resources, the materiality of it, and Giddens is, and Bordeaux is more interested in the actual uh, cultural components and symbolic uh, dimension of it. So one is a little bit more material, and the other one is more leaning towards the symbolic uh, aspect of it. So social structure, according to Bourdieu, will be traditions, institutions, moral codes, and established ways of doing things. Individual action, similarly important. Social structure can and is changed by people when people start to ignore rules replace them or rep reproduce them differently. So that explains how at the same time the structure frames the course of action, but it is also in, in the moment in which the action is taking place, it is transformed by those individual agents. Let's take a look at this in a more sort of um, uh, graphic way. So. Bourdieu will be interested in exploring ha what happens when the individual enters or moves into or assumes its positionality as member of the society. Well, he says, first of all, we need to understand society as a series of layers, right? Those layers will be social groups, will be institutions, will be social, uh, social spaces, right? Social spaces, institutions, social groups. Um, within these layers, you will have the habitus occurring. And the habitus is comprised of uh, social facts, economic facts, and then of cultural capital. That's the sets of rules of engagement are um, are rules that are that have this nature of being social, economic, and cultural in nature. So the individual learns or earns these uh, understandings of the rules and ways of engaging, and we call that the habitus. And with the habitus, they move into the society. Now, the society accumulates these uh, these um, sets of um, rules through time and uses that as as the rubric that is used to examine the individual activity within, within that specific field of action. So the social practices are therefore framed um, by the dogs, uh, but it are, are also resulting from the habitus, and the habitus is something that individuals can and normally change. The individuals then, uh, more, than in, in, uh, more than anything else, will be endowed with the symbolic capital, which is uh, social, economic, and cultural capital that will then enable them to act in in a free way within the social fields um, or, or layers uh, that he calls fields, and uh, and and then those fields have an accumulation of those um, rules and uses those rules to examine the practice of the individuals in the field. All right, so I want to finish my, um, my conversation on, on, on this core element of the theory of uh, Bordeaux by just going over 
the contents of um, of the, um, the logic of uh, practice that uh, that is one of the seminal books by by Bourdieu, and then you will see how it's less intimidating when you when you look at it by um, once you have understood what is it that he's trying to explain. So in the first section, he explores the mechanics of of um, uh, of the rules of practice, uh, having a field as as um, as, as the unit of analysis. So what are the rules that are in place in a specific field? And he starts uh, very much so like an ethnographer using case studies to try to see if that understanding of, of um, the function of the, of the field is actually reflected in, in the specific cases. So in, in, in a way, it's a deductive approach that he's using. He has this understanding and then he goes to the field to see if the field uh, for example, the family, the field of kinship, will actually uh, represent uh, correctly those understandings. And by looking at those specific cases, he can come back and confirm the, that uh, hypothesis, that working hypothesis, right? So he studies um, uh, marriage within within a family, and specifically studies the parallel causing marriages. I don't know if you remember, a parallel cousin will be the cousin that um, was born um, off of the uh, sibling of the same um, of the same gender as one of your parents. So, for example, uh, in pink we will represent female. Uh, this is your mother. This is you. So, a cross cousin will be any children of your mother's sister. So, these ones are parallel cousins, right? Your mother has a brother, and your brother has children. And those siblings are not your parallel cousins, but are your cross cousins. And on the other end, you have your father, who might have a sister and a brother. So in the case of your father's sister's kids, they are your cross cousins. But your father's brother's kids will be your parallel cousins. So he explores in different societies what are the different rules of play in terms of allowing or, or not allowing parallel causing certain societies is, is so wrong to have uh, marriages within um, within parallel causes that uh, those are deemed even illegal in is that the case of Iceland for example in which you have a, a very um, endogamic population that has been um, that's it's a small population some, somewhat isolated so a marriage with, between parallel cousins will be very costly biologically because you would have a tendency to multiply any genetic issues that you have with parallel cousins. But in a society that has um, more um, has is not as as um, embedded in in um, in endogamic practices. When the parallel cousins marriage happens, then there's no rules, so the rules are much more lax, and it's not necessarily seen as as uh, as terrible as it's in, in other societies, right? So, um, so he explores that, and he sees that a system that um, apparently should be firm and stable, it changes through the time in the practice of the individuals. Uh, that's a really interesting chapter to read. Uh, he by exploring the case and he goes into the structures of the habitus which is how is the habitus comprised of those rules that I mentioned and uh, and then how then how then that the frames the practice that we engage in the different fields so the magical discovery of Bordeaux is that if we explore the practice in a, in any given field we will be able to to unlock the uh, the, um, the the mysteries of that specific social field or that specific society. So it is in the practice that society is is unfolding into what it is, and then becoming something different by the very fact uh, that those agents that are engaged in the practice will be transforming the rules of engagement. All right. So it's um, this is my second presentation uh, regarding uh, Bourdieu. Thank you very much.